just one day in the year. Dress up. Let's, let's have fun with it. Amen. In the house of God, there's joy and there's life forevermore. Amen. Amen. Great. So if you're watching us online, please uh, subscribe to the page. Like the page. Can I just see how many people are subscribed to Mavuno Kampala page? Surely if you are not subscribed, there's something wrong and you are here. <laughs> Okay, good. If you are not yet subscribed, please go. And you know what? Please like the page. I just learned this week that the more likes a video get, the more YouTube pushes it out to people. So imagine the evangelism you can do just by liking. How many times you watch it, just like. Keep liking so that YouTube can push the message out to people. Amen? Amen? It doesn't take anything from you. Just like. Please. <laughs> Amen. Great. I'm excited to be bringing God's word to you today. For those of you who do not know, my name is Osai Obo Onen. I'm married to one tall, dark, and handsome pastor, Michael Obo Onen, who is not here today. He's all the way in Entebbe. Uh, did I pronounce it right? Entebbe? Entebbe. Anyway, you get it. All the way in Entebbe, Mavuno Gateway, bringing God's word uh, to that community. And he sends his love. Do you receive? Yes, you receive. Great. So, how are you doing today? How are you really doing? I mean, how I look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, how are you doing? How are you doing? Like, how are you really doing? I don't mean the I am fine answer. Mm -mm. Like, how are you really doing? I can see some animated conversations. Please do not cry. First wait, first wait. Let us talk about the sermon, then you can cry, okay? Don't cry, don't fall down here and throw your legs up. Don't throw a tantrum. Let's have the conversation. <laughs> okay. Now, the reason why I'm asking, the reason why I ask this question is because we live in a stressful and anxious world today. How many of you agree? It's crazy out there. Now, although COVID-19 pandemic is past, like many Ugandans who don't want to wear masks, if you ask them why, they say, ah, COVID is finished. Although COVID pandemic is past, but what it did was aggravate the situation at hand. It aggravated the depression, the stress. Oh, allow me to pause and just celebrate this human at the door who is looking fantastic. Lisa, you look, oh, and Amos, are they not looking great? You see, she should have come early and taken the cake instead of that, that group. Anyway, back to what I was saying. <laughs> now, COVID, what it did to us was just aggravate the situation. Many people reported symptoms of depression, of anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. You know, many people especially young people, were left vulnerable to social isolation and disconnectedness. Feeling feelings of anxiety, uncertainty, and loneliness leading to behavioral problems. Now, for children and adults, many who were made to stay at home, and for Uganda, two years during this time, were at risk, at risk of abuse, at risk of neglect, at risk, great risk, and many women also experience some form of violence or the other, either indirectly or directly. Coming to businesses, many people lost their jobs. Many businesses were shut down. And when we thought it was all over, COVID is gone, what happened? Ah? The war in Ukraine brought on the cassava economy that we are all feeling right now. We can't buy bread anymore. We have to eat cassava. Why might it healthy for you to eat? Amen? <laughs> and when we thought that the war was dying down and we're not hearing news of it anymore, what happened? Ebola. Ebola came in. Now, all this negative news that we have been getting has been fueling an emotional state of being, a, a negative emotional state of being. That's why in this series, we want to talk about how people, God's people should react or respond to all this that is happening now around us we want to find a way of getting well emotionally and mentally that's why i asked the question how are you really doing amen amen 
Now, as we start off today, allow me to ask a bold question. Allow me to, sorry, make a bold statement that all of us, all of us suffer from some level of emotional or mental imbalance. Yes, all of us. So, in case you are there sitting down and looking all nice and dandy, <laughs> there's a problem. <laughs> All of us suffer from some form of mental or emotional imbalance. Now, why do I say this? Let's look at the definition by World Health Organization of, of what um, mental health is. Now, according to WHO, mental health, can I have it on the screen so that everybody can read with me? Mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her abilities can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Guys on the media team, please pay attention. Please put that on the screen. <laughs> Again, mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. In other words, a healthy person is secure in who they are. They are not negatively affected by stress. They live fruitful lives and are a blessing to those around them. Look at your neighbor and say, are you okay? Based on what we have said, are you okay? What is the Luganda way of saying it? Only steady. Because <laughs> I, I, I can't pronounce the other one, so allow me to say the one. Only steady. Are you okay? Do they look okay? Or they look cross-eyed? After this definition, do they look cross-eyed? <laughs> wow. Well, if this is true, the level of, that level of well-being, where there was no stress, there was no anxiety, only existed in the Garden of Eden. Only. That's the only place that it existed. Zero stress. Everything worked just right. The price for food was just, in fact, there was no price. It was free. There was enough sunshine, so you didn't need yaka. There was enough fresh air, so you didn't need to breathe in other people's flu. No disease, no stress. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. I hope you came with your Bibles. As much as you're looking beautiful and on point, I hope you remembered your Bibles. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. Track with me. I'm going to be using the Message Bible so that it settles properly. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflect in our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. Let's continue together. God created. Look at the screen. Feel the earth. Take charge. Be responsible for the fish. Thank you for the reading of your word, O oh God. May it bring life to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Second service, sit up. You have eaten, sit up. <laughs> sit up and read God's word with power. 
So what an amazing service, uh, sorry, statement that was. What an amazing statement that God made humans to be God-like. Imagine as you are seated, seated there, you are God-like. Look at your neighbor. Do they look like God? Or they look like their grandparents? Huh? You are made to be God-like. Like him, to reflect his nature. And guess what? He blessed them so they would prosper and succeed. Chapter 2 continues to tell us that he gave them a fertile land, teeming with vegetation, all fruits of life. The mountains were beautiful with greenery. You get a sense that there was no disease. There was no sickness. There was no WhatsApp where people are sending you messages and disturbing your life. There was no landlord calling you for rent. It was peaceful. It had every good thing that we could think of, even precious metals. It had gold. It had rivers that were, you know, watering it and making it flourish. It had life. It was a delightful place. No stress. In fact, the meaning of Eden is a delightful place a paradise, a state of innocence, bliss, ultimate happiness. Just listening to this, wouldn't you want Eden? Huh? Don't you want Eden? Just, you just enjoy peace. No wonder God said it was good. So good. The message Bible says so good, so very good. <laughs> the truth is, as human beings, we are created to reflect the nature of God. We are created for paradise, for bliss. Now, let me make it practical. Have you ever been window shopping? Uh -uh, ladies, don't look at me like that. You go window shopping every time on your phones, looking for shoes and bags. That is what? Phone shopping. But you're not buying, so you're just looking. You know, window shopping does not mean that you are buying. Some of us, you go window shopping, they abuse you, you carry yourself and you live there. After all, you are not buying, nobody can tie anything on you. Have you ever been window shopping and then you find something that you really like? That feeling, you, you know that feeling? That feeling of, oh, this is beautiful. Huh? That feeling right there, that's the one. We were created for the majestic we are created for good things, not for hassle. This one of waking up on Monday morning and crying that it is Monday. I don't want to go to work. We are created for enjoyment. <laughs> we are created to reflect the image of God. Now, let me give you a very practical example. So, when my family was expanding, or, or have we stopped expanding? I don't know. God might be in the business of another baby, but I don't know. Anyway, so when my family was expanding, we... <laughs> Pastor Mike is not here, so you cannot be amening into that. <laughs> so when my family was expanding, we, we started going um, house hunting or window shopping for houses. I knew the budget. I knew that this is how much my darling husband, who is very astute with numbers, had said that this is what we are going to spend. But I will still carry myself to some high-rise areas anyway, just to see. Ah, there's no harm in seeing. There's no harm. After all, you don't pay for seeing, so you go and see. So we, I went one of those days, and I found myself in this, you know, gated community. Guys, just approaching the gate alone, yeah? the feeling I got was, I want... The Ascari asked me questions like I was going for an exam. Who are you? What do you want? What are you coming to look for here? Do you have an appointment? We are not seeing anyone. I was like, dude, me, I'm just, I just want to. In fact, I started making up stories. Yes, my sister's husband's child. I want to go and claim them from inside there. And then the guy allowed me to enter. As soon as I walked in, oh Lord, it was a beautiful place. The lawns. Perfectly manicured. Please hear what I said. Manicured, not slashed. 
there is a difference. Manicured. The grasses, there was no one taller than the other one. They were all the same height. It was a, a mansionette. I walk into the house, the show house, the windows high, that means the sun could enter them nice, enter through the, uh, into the house nicely. You know, fresh air could also enter. The fence just high enough for my neighbor to mind their business and for me to be cordial. Good morning. How are you? See you. By the time I was living there, I was certain this is my house. I claim it. I receive it. I walk in it. This is my lawn. I claim it. I receive it. I had seen my children riding their bicycles around the compound. So I knew this would have to do with a lot of convincing. So I had a plan in my head. But people who know Pastor Mike, you know that plan just went sweet. Not. When I was telling him the price, he just said, cancel. You are not going there. We can't afford it. This is what we are doing. But just the feeling I got there was when I get this house, if I ever lived here or if I ever bought a house here, I have arrived. Me and my family, we can write our names on Guinness Book of Record because we have arrived. That feeling of the majestic. Because we have, because we have been created in the image of God, our spirits connect with good things. Our spirit connects with the majestic when we approach it, when we see it. For some of us, it might not be a house. Some of us, it might be hiking on, you know, a green place. Ah, Pamela is here. Pamela hikes. She's a mountain slayer, you people. I have a mountain slayer in my, in my zone. Please put your hands together for Pamela. So imagine that feeling you get when you see, you know, greenery. That same feeling of, oh, this is beautiful. Or for guys, when you see a shiny gadget. What is the newest Apple now? 14. What about you people? It's going to reach 100. You people are going to keep buying. It is the same thing we are all using. <laughs> anyway, when you see, you know, a new gadget, it appeals to you. Hmm? For some people, it might be shoes, bags, clothes. Just the feeling of the majestic. You know why you have that feeling? It's your godlike nature seated right inside of you. That godlike nature. But let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. He says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees, in the garden but God said you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die you will not certainly die the serpent said to the woman for God knows that when you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil please excuse me when God created them did they not already have his nature huh so imagine what the devil came to do here right now with this conversation he came to shake their trust like, oh, maybe, maybe I was not really created in God's image. And he came to who? Women. 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 My sisters, please, I beg you. When you have nothing else to do, go and pray. This one of listening to everyone, talking to everyone. That is where our problem starts, by the way. That when the man enters the house, you start to dish out instructions, just like Eve did to her, to her husband, Adam. He said, did God really say? They were already created in his image. It was like he wanted to give them validation of sort. And they didn't need it. Did God really say? Many of us, we underestimate what happened there. Because as soon as Adam and Eve listened and followed what the devil told them, they immediately fell. And this falling, it was not just a trip. Oh, I walked on a stone and I tripped. Many people say, oh, they had, we have kids in the house who can understand. No, they, okay. Some people say they had sex. They ate the, the forbidden fruit. <laughs> Trust me, the devil is too smart for that. Too smart. Too smart. 
Instead, he devised a way to make them rebel, to make them disobey, to make them not trust God, to move their trust from God, Abba Father, the creator of the heaven and earth, in, which, in whose image that they were formed, he, he, removed, he wanted them to remove that attention from God and focus it on something else. And what he was willing them into was a worship of self. Did God really say? It's a lie. It's a lie. If you eat it, your eyes will just be open. And then you start seeing things like God. The devil wanted something that God had given them. A precious gift that God has given them. Which was what? Rulership. Remember in chapter 1? He said, take dominion, rule the earth. What he came to do was steal that rulership from them. And also to remove them from the covenant relationship that they had with God to worship of something else, worship of self. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, Uri, steady. So he, ta- he came to take, he came to deceive them into submitting their rulership and dominion to him. Their object of worship moved from God and move to self. And that is what the devil was after and is still after today. It has not changed. The tactics has not changed. It has just covered up itself in a way that you might not recognize it. In chapter 2 of Genesis, God had warned Adam and Eve that if they ate of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil, they would die. Not so. Huh? But did they really die that day? Like, did they fall down and die? But they died in other ways. They died in other ways. Let me, let me show you how they died. One, they died a spiritual death. They lost their covenant relationship with God and became slaves to sin. Two, they died an environmental death. The earth became cursed because of them. That they no longer enjoyed their labor. That is why on Monday, we cry before we go to work. I don't want, you cry like a baby. <laughs> when we say, come and give your prayer point, you first say, Lord, kill my boss. Yeah, some people don't want, they're like, ah, ah, my boss is wicked. Lord, either you transfer or you just slay. God is not going to answer that prayer. <laughs> They died a physical death. From then on, humans became mortal beings. You know, because you are created godlike, that means that at some point you actually had eternal life. Like, like you were immortal. You were an avenger. <laughs> you were immortal. But because of that, 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 that fall, we became mortal. Our lifespan was cut short. Societal death also happened. Human relationships became manipulative and unjust. People became wicked to each other. Immediately after that, what happened? The first murder on earth happened, which was... Huh? Who killed who? Let me see if you attended Sunday school properly. Who killed who? Cain killed... People have left it there. Abel, 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 that that one. Cain killed Abel. That was as a result of the fall. And one more, soul death happened. Shame became part of the human condition, and this brought many dysfunctions, such as low self-esteem, psychological problems, addictions, depression, stress, so on. But ever since the fall, humans, we as human beings, have yearned for that relationship. We have yearned for that connection again. We have yearned for that covenant again. That is why many times there's, you suddenly feel a void. Like there's a hole on the inside of you. And no matter what we do, we can't seem to fill that hole. You know why you can't fill the hole? It's a God-sized hole. It's too big. 
Didn't you sing that song in Sunday school? Too big, too wide, too tall, too deep. Are you, how are you trying to fill that too big hole? A God-sized hole. We have yearned to be in relationship with Abba Father again. But instead, we have found a world that is exactly opposite. Exactly opposite. It's full of stress. It's full of anxiety. It's full of suffering. You see, we were created to be connected with God and in a loving relationship with Him, a loving, intimate relationship with Him. And when we don't have that relationship, we experience it. We, we, we feel it like it is tangible. You can almost hold it. I, I don't know. How many of you have felt that way? Because I don't want to believe that I'm the only one who has felt that way. How, how many people here? Just slip your Just, yeah. Thank you, my dear. You know, people are obedient in this church. Some of you are hiding. We are all here together. We are here to solve all our problems together, including mine. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Now, this hole, this void that we experience is what psychologists call the existential crisis. Big word. My people say big word that can kill a small dog. Big word. Existential crisis. Now, what this means is it's a loss of ability to find meaning to life. Like you just, you're like, there's nothing to live for. Have you ever seen people who are rich, like they have it together, but they are sad? Huh? For example, Solomon. Solomon had it, including 1,000 women. Now, please, for, forgive me as I rabbit trail a bit. 1,000 women, you must really have a lot of money. Because from wife one to wife 1,000, you are buying shoes clothes, bags, earrings, lollipops for children. Like, there's just a lot to deal with. You have to make time. You have to, eh! He had it all. The Bible says that he was so good, so wealthy, that gold became as common as stone in Israel. If gold was as common as stone in Uganda, I think all of us would just die and go to heaven because it would be a shock. It was as common as stone. He did it like he had it all. He was so blessed that God gave him the opportunity to build his temple. Imagine his father David was the man after God's own heart. Not so. Did God call any other person in the Bible a man after my heart? It was only David. But God didn't give David that opportunity. God gave it to his son. And said, build my temple. He was that blessed. But throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, all he was saying was, Meaningless! meaningless imagine having all that and everything that comes out from your mouth is what meaningless let's go to ecclesiastics chapter 2 verse 9 to 11 where solomon wrote some powerful words he said i denied myself nothing my eyes desired i refused my heart no pleasure my heart took delight in all my labor, and this was a reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all, the, uh, all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Can you imagine how rich and blessed Solomon was? The Bible says there's no one that attained to his wealth. Till now, till today. So imagine all our African leaders put together and all their things, they still don't reach where Solomon was at that time. Blessed man saying what? Meaningless. We can see this kind of thing with even our Hollywood stars. When I heard of the death of, uh, what's his name? I keep forgetting his name. Mrs. Doubtfire. Eh? Robin Williams. <laughs> There is an 80s baby with me here. <laughs> Robin Williams. When I heard of his death, it shocked me. You know why? All his movies, did he ever look sad? Did he ever look sad? In fact, he was a comic character in all the movies. So, death. Existential crisis. When you completely lose the meaning to life. Meaningless. 
vain, all my toil. Nothing seems to satisfy. Because, as I said before, it's a what? God's size void. Now, because we are longing, we are longing to get back to that covenant relationship, we tend to take matters into our hands. You tend to work harder than you usually work because you are looking for fulfillment from work. You tend to buy things that you don't even need because you are looking for fulfillment from property. You tend to gather around yourself friends that you might not even need because you are looking for what? Validation. You are looking for somebody to tell you, oh, you look nice today. While I was preparing for this sermon, I, I stumbled on, on something, and the Holy Spirit has just brought it to, to mind. There was this Nigerian guy who was uh, a sc- scammer, scamist, what is the word? Who scams? <laughs> Internet fraud. <laughs> that guy was rich. His name was Hush Puppy. He was rich, like rich. Hush Puppy was rich. Guess what happened? Guess where his downfall started? He started looking for admiration on social media. He was looking for following. He would take pictures with people who are, you know, rich or influencers. He was looking for following. So you, you do things just to look for the valida- validation, affirmation for somebody to say, you look good. Oh gosh, you have money. I wish I was like you. But deep down inside, what is happening to you is just an existential crisis. Your soul is longing for something deeper than that, but you think that when you have people around you, that is it. You think that when you have property, that is it. You think that when you have money, that is it. You think that when you have power, that is it. Soul, death, existential crisis. The human potential movement teaches us that self-improvement is possible without God. We are encouraged to avoid people with negative energy. Have you heard of those people who be like, no, please, positive energy, me, I'm about that vibe. (laughs) Please, good things only. (laughs) Have you heard those people? Huh? I'm not about the hard life. <laughs> me, I only want positive vibes around me. In fact, I have a relative who all she says is positive vibes only, please. Positive vibes. I'm like, chick, seriously. So the rest of us, we are what? Minus one. The New Age movement teaches us that we can experience love and light through personal transformation and healing. It means that you can be you. It means that you can heal yourself. It means that you can be your own person. Does it sound, does it sound bad? Like if you, if you heard this, somebody saying, just do you, it's okay. D- does it sound off? Second service, does it sound off? It doesn't, eh? It doesn't. You, you can be like, yeah, 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 just do you. But guess where the problem is in that statement? Just do you focusing on yourself without God. That's what the problem is. How many of you have seen this cartoon turning red? Ah, uh, uh, second service, you people, be real. Aha, uh-huh, yes, thumbs up. Do you know the song that is in that cartoon? By the way, I listened to the words again and I was like, wait a minute. The song, I did it on my own. Huh? You know what? Let's empty Mavuno kids and bring them here. They know that song properly. They will sing it. It says, you went for it. You went for it. You went for it. You, something, something. And baby, you got it. You did it on your own, on, on. That, the bridge says, that bag, oh yeah. The shoes, oh yeah. You want it, you got it. You want it, you got it. When I properly listened to it, I was like, wait, so where is God in that statement? Like, where is God in that statement? And this is what our kids are watching, by the way. 
Where is God? Turn in red, yeah. Don't go and look for it. Now I'm seeing people's eyes are like, Google, Netflix. Don't go and look for it. <laughs> but where is God in that statement? My son said I was singing it the other day, and I told him, my friend, I rebuke that song in this house. You will not sing it here. And he was like, but mommy, why? I said, did you, did you hear God in it? In fact, do you people sing it in Sunday school? He said, no. I said, then that is the end of the song. No more. <laughs> Dr. Strange. Who has seen Dr. Strange? I'm going to be giving examples. You better be real. Have you seen the amount of uh, hands are raising up? People in this section, eh, they be feeling holier than thou. <laughs> it's okay. All of us are responsible for the death of Jesus. Doctor Strange, have you seen the amount of witchcraft in that movie? Like, if you have not seen, then I don't know. Maybe, maybe you need to see the people from my village before you believe. <laughs> have you seen the amount of, of self-help that is in that movie? And that is what we are being taught. And it has slowly seeped into our systems. It has slowly seeped into our doctrine. Self-help. The worship of self, no more God. The devil has so manipulated us and given these people enough budget to push their agenda. Enough budget. You think those movies coming out of Hollywood, it is your car, can, Ugandan shillings? No, my dear. There's budget pushing it and we are accepting it we are welcoming it into our society, into our, even into our homes. And there's a problem. There's a problem. Those things are pushing for self-help, worship of self. Religions that we are practicing today, Eastern religions, things like yoga. They're like, no, it's for meditation. Ha, ha, ha. Shock on you. <laughs> when you you open yourself to those kind of things. What you are doing is subscribing to that religion. You can't remove a practice from the source. You can't. It's like taking Christ and separating it and saying Christian, Christianity is different. Christ is different. Is that possible? Huh? You guys answer me. Is that possible? So how do you think that you can take yoga out of Hinduism? And say it is what? I am just meditating. I'm calming myself down. You are subscribing to that God. That's what you're doing. Allow me to be free. Allow me to be vulnerable to you. And allow me to talk to you as your pastor. When you do things like that, you are subscribing to that God. There is no, there is no shortcoming. There is no sorry, shortcuts around it. Oh, no. I just meditated and it's okay. In fact, while I was meditating, I was saying, Jesus. No, you are subscribing to that God. When you practice palm reading, guess what you are doing? You are subscribing to witchcraft. Yes, it's not the African witchcraft where they are dancing. Why are those white witches are even more scarier than ours in Africa? You are subscribing to witchcraft. When you are doing th using crystals for cleansing, or using, what they call it, these things, incense, you are subscribing to that God. You can't remove the practice from the source. You can't. And all this we are doing, trying to find solution to that void that we are feeling inside. That God-like nature that we, we have lost to that covenant relationship that we have lost. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, or is there day? The problem with these human solutions is that it does not bring the paradise that it promises. Instead, it brings even worse things to us, worse situation. The, the, it becomes worse What's the other word for was was what was what? <laughs> you people stop making me say these things. It's not nice, huh? You move from was to was what? 
in your, in your need to self-help, to fulfill that void that you are feeling. But what do we do? What do we do? How do we get out of this mess? How do we begin to position ourselves mentally and emotionally to become healthy people? What do we do? What we do is to return to Eden. Return to that place that was bliss. Return to that place that was paradise. Return to your covenant relationship with God. Self-help, self-fulfillment, Eastern religions, practicing of all these things does not take you there. Does not fill the, the gap. Does not fill the void. Instead, you are taking shortcuts to problems. The only way to fill that void is return to your covenant relationship with God. Return to Eden. Return to the place where you felt loved you understood your purpose. You understood the God that you serve loves you. I'm going to be telling us ways in which we can return. And I will say it in ABC. Look at your neighbor and say ABC. ABC. A means to acknowledge. Acknowledge. Acknowledge your independence. Acknowledge that you have moved away from God. Acknowledge that you have practiced self-help and as a result, self-worship. Acknowledge your sin. Confess and renounce the counterfeit ideologies you have embraced by living for personal glory, by living for false, for, for false fulfillment, self-fulfillment, by engaging in occultic practices and liberal lifestyle. Some of us, our senses to sin is so, allow me to say, dead. Like, you don't, you don't feel it when you even tell a lie. You're like, ah, ah, see, we are trying to survive. So you tell a lie, that we cover another lie, that we cover another lie. My dad always used to say, that a liar is a thief, a thief is a murderer. And one day, that person who has done these things will marry a witch. <laughs> Nigerians and their parables. Confess in the ways where you have walked away from God. Confess ways where you have taken on your own problems and solved it yourself, where you have not sought God. Confess. Confess. Come clean. God is not asking for anything. He's not asking for any price. He's not asking for your money. He's not asking for anything because he has already given everything for you. The greatest price anybody could have given for our sin was that sacrifice on the cross. And God already did it for us. So what he's saying now is, come, confess, repent. Capish, finished, that's all. Come, confess, repent. So A is what? Acknowledge your independence. Acknowledge your sin. Amen? Take that step and say, Lord, that is me. I have been working for self-fulfillment. I have been striving to make my name be on the, on the board at work. Those things, do they look like that? Do they sound like they're bad? They're not bad. What are you doing? You are engaging in self-help. So confess today. Confess. B is what? Believe. I said A, B, C. B is what? Believe. Believe. We reorient ourselves towards God by believing that he is the one true God. Here we are saying that God, that God, you are my source and you are my salvation. Hebrews 11 says, says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. At the heart of all our emotional struggles and at the heart of every new religion that is born is these two questions. Does God exist? And if he exists, does he care? How many of us have found ourselves in situations like that when you're asking, seriously, God, are you there? Are you watching these things happen to me? I have found myself there when I was dark and, and in, a, in a state of depression. 
I kept asking, God, is, are, you, are you truly there? And you say you, you, you care about me. Like, are you there? But the moment you are able to answer this question, is God there? You get into a state of mind where you, you now understand and believe that there's a God that lives and breathes and his name is not Osai. His name is not Kathy. His name is not Sam Barnabas Aliko. Neither is his name Rita Isiko. That he's alive and well and that he cares for you. When you answer that question, you stop doing all the running around that you are doing. Life becomes a bit easier for you. Not even a bit, a lot more easier for you. Because you don't have to stress anymore. You know that God is in control. You will know that God is what? He's in control. And no matter where I run to, no matter what I do, because he exists, he cares for me. He loves me. Yes, things might not be working out just the way I want them right now, but I know that it's going to work out for my good. Amen? He says, draw nigh unto me as I draw nigh unto you. Somebody who does not exist, will he say, draw nigh unto me? Huh? He says, I'm an ever-present help in time of need. Somebody who does not exist, will he say, I'm an ever-present help? That means that if you saw as much called on him right now, he will answer you. If you called him into your situation, he will answer you. So why, why do we keep running around and trying to solve our own problems? You know why? Because we are still stuck at the question, does God exist? Does he love me? But I'm here to tell you today that what? He exists. And he what? Loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love that he gave the greatest price that anybody could ever give, the sacrifice of his son. Amen. Amen. You know, there are studies that have shown that faith followers have a better response to stress. Huh? Do you understand what I've just said? Or should I, I can't say it in Luganda, I'm sorry. <laughs> Faith followers, people who believe in God, people who believe in something, they are better equipped to deal with stress. For example, if you came here crying, oh, I'm so stressed. The next thing is pray for, and you'll be prayed for. And when you, you are prayed for, don't you feel lighter a bit? Yeah? So you are better equipped. Now imagine people who do not have faith, who do not know God. Imagine those people how they deal with stress. Do you think it's, it's an easy life for them out there? Huh? You guys, second service, you will answer. Wake up. <laughs> Wake up. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. Pastor Sai is talking to you. Wake up. So people who have a certain faith, huh? people who know their God, they can handle stress. They can handle stress. They can handle stress. And because they, are, they can handle stress. <laughs> no, you have taken me off my track. That person behind there. Anyway, as I was saying. So, God exists and he cares about us. King David, when he was faced with the dark trying times of his life, he wrote in Psalms chapter 4 verse 8, he said, In peace, I will lie down and sleep. Some of us, you have, you have refused to have peace, so the sleep will not even come. In peace, I will do what? Lie down and sleep. For you, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Because you know that you have a God who is alive and well, you can go to bed knowing that whatever situation I'm encountering, somehow God is going to fix it. You go to bed, open your mouth, drool and snore. And wake up tomorrow morning and say, Lord, thank you for the revelation you have given me. While I slept, I'm going to work. Because you know that your God is alive. You can say, I am a fearless influencer. Some of you will be saying that word like you are afraid to say it. Ah, huh? When you have the creator of the universe with you. He's about your business. He says that I have written your name on the palm of my hand. Like... He tattooed your name 
on the palm of his hand. So every time he looks at his hand, he's seeing you and say, hey, this is Zakia, my daughter. Blessed child. I love her so much. What can I do for her today? Because you know that you have a God who is presently waiting for you to cry out to him. You can say, I'm going to go into this day and I'll face it and I'll come back home a champion. But what many of us do is, you wake up in the morning, you don't even come for morning prayers. So let us even leave that one aside. You kneel down quickly, bring out your Excel sheet of needs. Have you seen that my neighbor who keeps parking in front of my house, clear that car. Now I need this amount of money by Tuesday, God. If you don't give it to me, 10 million, I will not love you anymore. Now you see, I've been telling you for 14 years, I want a, a husband. You have refused to give me a husband. You better sort me out. My mates are married with children. You throw your Excel sheet at him. He's longing for a relationship with you. You quickly run out and you say, Deuces, I will see you when I come back. And God is like, hey, this child of mine, can you even just, can, can we talk for a minute? He wants to talk to you, but you, you, want to, you want to give the guy lists like he's your ATM. He loves us, people. God truly loves us. He exists and he cares. Number three, C. He says, he says we can reorient ourselves towards God by actively engaging in soul care. People, no matter how busy you are, you owe it to yourself to take good care of yourself. You owe it to yourself. We cannot be called a lazy generation. You know why? We work like we work. If you are not at a job from 8 to 5, you are hustling making things to sell. You are sewing clothes, selling shoes. <laughs> Somebody was in the first service. Selling chili, everything, akabanga, everything is moving. You are cutting hair, you are making hair. You are... We can't be faulted that a generation that does not work. We work. But guess where our problem is? We don't take care of ourselves. We don't. That is why we have health issues. That's why this generation is plagued with health issues. And all the fellow workaholics say amen. amen. You know you are self. I'm talking to you as much as I'm talking to myself. We work like we are the soul, the author and finisher of our faith. You are moving from one job to the other, not taking care of yourself. People, you owe it to yourself to take care of yourself, both spiritually and physically. If you work for someone, why don't you go to work early? You see, the problem here is we want to go to work at 9 and leave at 4. How is that possible? You have not earned your salary for that day. No, please. Go to work early and do your time and don't take work home. Be determined not to take work home. I'm one person who used to take work home a lot. To the point that I said, no more laptop in my house. I don't own a laptop, personally. This iPad, if I'm not preaching, it is off and inside. Some, somewhere in the house, is there, I would never put it on, except I'm preaching or leading prayer. I learned my lesson the hard way. Last year, I had to go on a break for three months. That was not because I was fatigued alone. The core of my problem was I was going insane. I was losing it. You people think all this comes together by, by what? Angels. <laughs> There's one person responsible for it. So I had to work. Now, I do my 8 to 5 and I don't take work home. I don't. My husband is my boss. When it's 5 o'clock, I'm like, so I have clothes for the day and I am off. Sometimes I even go home at 1. Please, I didn't come to work at 9 so that I'm leaving at 1. No, I came since 
I come early, put in my work at one o'clock that day. I take a break. I tell my boss, I, in fact, I can't even send an email. Dear Pastor Mike, I am going home. <laughs> I have done my work for the day. <laughs> when I get home, I try to rest. If you have kids, huh, take five minutes. Some of us, our children, when they grow up, they will remember us for just shouting and beating them up. Because you came home with problems, with stress from work. You get home, throw your bag in one corner, enter the kitchen if you are a lady, start to cook. By the time dinner is ready, emotional energy finished. So now you are just throwing children in bed. Go to bed! Pa! Pa! That was me last year. I'd be like, I don't want to see you. If I see your face, you are finished. Disappear, condense on your bed. Don't, I don't. Evaporate. That's what I said. Evaporate. They'd be like, Mommy, evaporate. Go and condense on your bed, please. But now, because I go home and I don't take work home, and I'm not taking worry with me, I'm not taking stress with me, I'm more relaxed. I'm able to be in my space and, you know, love my children, love my family. Play worship music when you get home. It helps you to tone down. Some of you, you get home and the next thing, bang, 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 bang. the whole neighborhood is hearing your music. It doesn't help you relax. What worship music does for you is brings, settles your mind. Eh? It settles your mind. It just brings you back home. Be in your space. If you don't have children, enter your house, play worship music, and be by your lonely self and enjoy your lonely self. Your single life. Enjoy it. Graham, enjoy your single life. <laughs> by the way, we are praying for you. You better get married. Enjoy yourself by yourself at home. Don't take work home. Tone down. Have a daily rhythm of rest. Decide that I'll go home early and I'll rest. I won't take work with me. Have a weekly rhythm of rest. How many of us have Sabbaths here? If you practice the Sabbath day, like you take a day where you say, today I'm not working. Put a second service. Put up your hand if you have. Okay. Ah, that one is self-employed. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Great. Thank you very much. Now what you do by taking the Sabbath is... You are recognizing that God is your source. That's what you are doing. You are recognizing what? That God is your source. That he is your salvation. That you are not God unto yourself. Because he's the one that gives you the power to make wealth. If you take that one day off, nothing will die, by the way. Nothing will die. In fact, if you don't, you are the one who will die. Sorry, I'm sorry to be... <laughs> People have already started looking at me funny. You're the one who will be stressed out. You're the one who will be sick. And all that money that you think you have made, you spend it on? Hospital. Tell your neighbor, my money. Tell your neighbor, my money will not fund negativity. Amen? So, give yourself rest. Decide that on this day, I'm going to work half day and go home and rest or take a take the weekend it's not sunday because sunday is family day everybody comes home on sunday maybe friday or saturday i don't know just take a day a time off and rest if you can go somewhere and if you are tired please sleep sleep is good the bible says he gives his beloved sleep you are the beloved of the lord he has given you sleep can you go and sleep? Go and sleep. And enjoy that sleep. Rest. Let your body recalibrate. Let your mind recalibrate. Take care of yourself. Amen? Take care of yourself. Even take care of yourself spiritually. Find a community that loves Jesus. Please join our discipleship group. We have said it here over and over. It's becoming a song. We are now singing to the choir. Join a discipleship group. In a discipleship group, you have community that loves you. You have community that cares for you. 
You have community that you can say, guys, I'm not feeling good today and they're able to support you. But what is your problem? You want to do bad all by yourself. Me, I, have, I was in a cell and I got burnt. So I don't like people anymore. Me, I love Jesus, but his children I don't like. Who told you that there's anything as a private Christian? Who told you? Who gave you that lie? You think Christianity is private? Ah! It is not, my friend. Shock! Christianity is not private. You cannot be a private Christian and survive. In fact, the Bible says the devil is a what? Roaring lion looking for who to what? Devour. So you by yourself, imagine you are just there dangling like bait. Then he'll first send his small, small demons at you of headache. Then you'll be like, headache, these migraines are not going. Pastor, pray for me. No, go and join a discipleship group. Your headache will go. I'm always sick. I always have the flu. Go and join a discipleship group. There they will even tell you, boiled ginger, lemon, honey. Somebody will give you a solution. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself physically. Take care of yourself spiritually. Amen. How many of us are in discipleship groups? Oh, nice. If you are not in one, I beg you, after this sermon, be a practitioner of the word. Sign up for one. Let us stop praying for headache. Let us pray for bigger things. Ten million, you know, projects, businesses. That is where we want to be praying. You know, we are taking over Uganda. That's a prayer, not pray for me. I have a headache. I have malaria. If you are in a discipleship group, somebody will help you drain the water around your house so that mosquitoes stop living there. Ah. Many times when I get home, when my kids come running, I have a, a touchy foolish child. His name is Imani. He loves to hug. His, his love language is touch. So when he comes, when I come from work and he's like, Mommy! I'll be like, Imani, give mommy five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Because I've come from work, I'm not in the mood to be touched or hugged. Like today was a stressful day. Imani, first give mommy five minutes. So after five minutes, he, he has a watch so he can time you. You hear it be peep, peep. He comes back to the door. Mommy, the five minutes is over. <laughs> But imagine I have now settled in. I can hug him, love on him, kiss him, play with him. Don't be remembered as that parent who just chappered me the whole time. You know, some of us have horrible memories of our parents. It was chapa or yelling. Yelling. Have you brushed your teeth? Yes. Open it. And one more thing I would like to mention. People, exercise. Now I'm talking to myself as well. Exercise. Some of us don't like to exercise. You, you cannot run around your building to save your life. They say run. You would rather die than run. That is me, by the way. I w- in fact, just kill me instead of going for that jog. I can't. <laughs> We are many. We shall create a WhatsApp group. No exercise. Jesus is our savior. Exercise. Exercise releases feel-good hormones. Huh? And you feel fresh. I was joking in the first service. Rita Sion, Sion Fitness, used to come to work and exercise us. She was exercising us by force. You people would just be crying. Ah! Rita is like, raise your leg. We're like, <laughs> Rita, please, no, raise your leg. People exercise. After that exercise, you feel good. Take long walks. Jump around with your children when they are playing. It won't kill you. In fact, it will be fun for the whole family. Huh? You imagine you will not die. That's your heart that is overbeating when you walk. It's not going to die. <laughs> it's just getting used. <laughs> Exercise. It releases what? Feel good hormones. Amen. Amen. So three ways to begin to reorient with God and return to Eden. A is what? 
Acknowledge what? Your independence. B is what? Believe that God is in control. C is what? Care for yourselves. So next week, we are going to begin to unpack the tools that God has given us to restore us to emotional wholeness. And I believe that in this series, we will learn how to defeat stress and anxiety in our lives. So as I conclude in prayer today, as I conclude in prayer, I want to pray for anyone who is either you don't know Jesus or you have fallen out of your relationship with Jesus. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you have fallen out of a relationship with Jesus. You, you sought to self-help. You sought to fulfill your own needs with your own strength. You have engaged in the Eastern religions of yoga, of astrology, of palm readings, and all that. If you are here, I would like to pray with you. You want to rededicate your life to Christ, or you want to come into a loving relationship with Christ for the first time. If you are here, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please put up your hand. I will see you and we will pray together. And if you are online, please just send a message to the Mavno Uganda family number and say that you have just received Christ as your Lord and Savior and there will be somebody to pray with you. Is there anyone like that here? Okay. All be it, we shall pray together. I want us to repeat these words with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus. Come on, second service, open your mouth and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I have lived life under my own terms and not looked to you as the one who is my source of life. I renounce works of Satan and ask that you forgive me. I now choose to surrender my life to you and commit to serving you only. I invite you to come into my life and take over as Lord and Savior over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Great. If you have just said that prayer, thank you for recommitting your life to Christ. Amen. And the next prayer I would like to pray is for people who are stressed and anxious. You are stressed and anxious. And I'm going to ask you to do a bold thing today and just stand up. You are stressed at work. You are stressed at home. You are stressed by your extended family. You are anxious of tomorrow. You don't know what it holds. You don't, you don't know where to go. You, are, you, know, you might be seeking help. If you are the one, just stand up. By the way, we are all in this together. I am standing. Imagine I'm standing. Don't be shy. This is a family where we bring our needs together to God and he hears us. Father, I just commit these ones into your hands. I thank you that you have given us a peace that passes all human understanding. And right now I ask for that peace to settle over these ones. I pray, Lord God, that if it is a work situation, that you will give them revelation on what to do, how to go about doing it, so that they will receive relief to the glory of your name. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will wade into this situation and bring about peace and bring about a settlement like never before. I pray, Almighty King, that if, even as they go about their week, that they will begin to experience that, that peace. They will experience that wholeness. They will experience that overwhelming love that comes from knowing that you are alive and that you care for us. I pray all these things, believing and trusting in Jesus, mighty and matchless name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. So I'm going to ask us all to rise up. Today we're going to take a communion. I want us to take a communion in remembrance of Christ, but also as a commitment to him, a commitment to a covenant relationship with Christ again. Amen. Are you ready for that? Huh? Okay, uh, can I ask the communion stewards as we did in the first service? Grab a tray. 
I need, I need hands. Where are my DG leaders? Please come forward. Come forward and move it quickly, quickly. As you receive the communion, please do not eat. I, hope, I know that you have eaten. So don't grab it and eat quickly. Just wait for the prayers to be said. Move it in, move it in. Quickly, quickly, quickly. We are doing this to reconnect and recommit to a covenant relationship with Abba Father, God the Father. Take it, take it quickly, quickly, quickly. There's no such thing as a private Christian. We're doing this together as a family. Great. Please lift it up. Lift it up. Lord, I thank you for these elements that we hold before us right now, before you. Oh God, it ceases to be ordinary, but it becomes the body and the flesh of our God and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We take this in remembrance of you. We take this also as a recommitment to you, entering into a covenant relationship with you. And as we do this, we do this in the, to the glory and the honor of your name. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Do not yet eat it. Wait. I want us to say this prayer together before we take it. Media team, I need my prayer up. Great. So we're going to say this prayer together and at the end of it, we eat of the bread and drink of the blood. Amen? Okay. One, two, go. Dear Jesus, I confess I have not lived. Loudly, loudly. I ask that you forgive me from these unrighteous ways. Through my sin, I have opened the doors. I've experienced depression, anxiety, fear, oppression, and bondage. And now bind these demonic spirits and command them to depart from my presence to the pit of hell where they belong. I close the doors to this spirit and ask to be released from the bondage that comes with worshiping self. I ask you, Lord, to cleanse me with the blood of Jesus from this defiling spirit and to heal me from the emotional damage that comes with demonic oppression. I commit to pursuing you by taking the time to rest well, to read in your word, and to worship in you. As I take this holy communion, I do so as a renewal of my covenant or commitment to worshiping you as a true God in Jesus' name. Amen. You may eat and you may drink. Well done. Well done. Put your hands together for yourselves. Come on, clap for yourselves and clap for Jesus. Now, the only way to maintain your faith, as I've said, is by committing to church, people. This is not the time to disappear from the community of faith. Commit to church. Remain in church. Don't disappear. Mama, Jackie, don't disappear. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God will fight for you. Amen. God will fight for you and you will hold your peace. But imagine... He will fight for you if you are committed to his body. He says the gates of hell cannot stand against the church. That's what the Bible says. 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. So imagine God is committed to the church. So don't disappear. Amen? Amen. Great. So next week, we're talking about emotional well-being at the workplace. We shall be examining the forces that contribute towards toxic work environments and what to do about it. As a takeout, we shall be praying. We shall be praying over your business, over your workplace. So please, some of you are looking and saying, hey, has Mavuno become that church? Yes, we have become that church. Bring your business certificate, employment letters. We are going to Shababa and pray over them. Amen? So next week, don't come for uh, yeah, looking good. Invite somebody and come with your business certificates employment letters school certificates those things that it's you, you call it your workspace huh? if it is a pen your favorite pen that you write with at work bring it we are praying on it <laughs> okay okay people great let me bless you as you go in the meantime tomorrow morning please find yourself in prayers okay as i said we are tired of praying for headache Come, let us pray together for big things. Huh? Find yourself in prayers, 4.30 a.m. And Zacchaeus' concert is coming up. Please buy a ticket right at the back. On the 15th is our concert. Now, stretch forth your hand and let me bless you. Lord, I thank you for your sons and your daughters right here. I want to speak a blessing over everything that concerns them this week. Lord God, I pray that in their going out and in their coming in, they will experience you. That Lord, no more will they have emotional baggage, but they will be called blessed of the Lord. They will say of a truth, I am the one God has shown mercy. That this week, oh God, they shall experience so much health and so much wellness that their mouths will not be big enough to say it. Lord, I speak over their households that it is protected. I speak over their cars, their everything that it belongs to them, their family members, their children, even their maids, everything that concerns them is blessed in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh God, that you will bring us together again tomorrow morning for prayers as we adore and worship you to the glory and honor of your name. For in Jesus' name we have prayed and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor, give them a high five and say, may the grace. God bless you and have a great week. Yeah, welcome.